This is going to be about yarns about yarn. So tales and tribulations we've encountered while deploying yarn, yet another resource negotiator in production. My name is Kathleen Teen. I joined Cloudera a little over four years ago as the first support engineer at Cloudera. And I've since transitioned more to a, a role in the field as a technical account manager slash customer success manager, managing our two largest customers. Miklash Christine joined Cloudera in 2013, and he also joined as a customer operations engineer, also known as a support engineer. He's also now transitioned to more of a role in the field, and, and he's a systems engineer on our largest customer. So between the two of us, we've definitely seen a lot of issues in the field. Apache Hadoop is an open source software framework for distributed storage and distributed processing of big data on clusters of commodity hardware. And what Cloudera does is we provide support services and training for deployment of these distributed systems. We're gonna talk about the motivation behind Yarn, talk about upgrading from MR1 to MR2, talk about some upgrade pitfalls with Yarn, and then I'll turn it over to Miklosh to talk about some of the applications on Yarn, specifically um, Llama, Hoya, and Spark, Spark on Yarn. So Miklosh will go into a lot of detail specifically on Spark on Yarn. Yarn motivation, yet another resource negotiator. Hadoop is not just MapReduce and HDFS. It's also a lot of, of ingest tools, such as Scoop, Flume, Kafka, uh, tools for ETL, like MapReduce, Hive, Pig, and Spark, tools for, uh, for data discovery, such as Impala Search, Apache Solar, uh, machine learning, and storage and streaming, such as HBase and Spark Streaming. One of the motivations behind Yarn was to allow you to be able to house many different workflows and many different use cases all in one cluster, so have a, a multi-tenant cluster. Um, for a, a long time, we've been recommending that our customers run MapReduce on one cluster and run HBase on another cluster, mainly because MapReduce is batch-oriented, HBase has low latency requirements, and running these two batch and, and low latency use cases on the same cluster uh, can, can lead to issues. But with the event of Yarn, that's in theory what Yarn is supposed to do is allow you to run a use case that is batch on the same cluster as a use case that has low latency requirements. I found this on Twitter and I thought I explained it better than Workout ever could. MapReduce is basically assembling all of these different ingredients, if you will, together to make one finished product, in this case, a sandwich. The timeline of Yarn, people ask me a lot, why are you talking about Yarn now? It's, it's been out since 2008, and that's true. In 2008, Yahoo started work on Yarn, and, and um, in over the course of four years, the community worked on Yarn and it became more and more production ready. It wasn't actually until four years later in June 2012 that Cloudera's distribution of Hadoop started including Yarn. In 2012, a few months later, Yarn was promoted to an Apache Hadoop subproject and then um, finally included in, in Hadoop 2.0 GA a year later. Starting in April 2014, Yarn became the default in CH5, and that's when we started recommending customers move and migrate to Yarn. So Yarn was always included in CDH, starting with CDH4, but it wasn't until Yarn became a lot more hardened and, and the community com continued to contribute to it that we became comfortable asking our customers to run production workloads on Yarn. The MapReduce one, um, diagram is, is pretty simple. You have your, your slave nodes known as task trackers. You have your, your master known as a job tracker. The job tracker is your bottleneck. 
you, the job tracker is responsible for scheduling jobs, managing jobs, storing jobs, and as a result, if your job tracker ever goes down, the task trackers, um, they, they, they lose sight of what they need to do. Um, and there's nothing the task trackers can do until the job tracker is back up and running. Um, so this is one of the reasons why in MR2, the functionalities of the job tracker were split into three different distinct entities. The resource manager for scheduling jobs, the application master for managing jobs, and the job history server for storing the jobs. And, and this way, you don't have that single point of failure with the job tracker responsible for so many things. The known managers took over for the task trackers. Um, and instead of um, the fine granularity of a map task versus a reduced task, we, we now have these tasks, these slots, um, that can be either a map task or a reduced task, depending on what is more needed at the moment. As I mentioned, the motivation for YARN was fourfold. Uh, first, for scalability, um, the, the job tracker is responsible for, for tracking all jobs, all tasks. As a result, it was maxing out. Yahoo discovered that it was maxing out at around 4,000 nodes, 40,000 tasks. By splitting up the responsibilities of the job tracker amongst the resource manager, the application master, um, we are now able to scale up to significantly more, to 10,000 nodes, to 100,000 tasks. Availability. MapReduce 1 had job tracker availability, high availability, but um, it's only with MR2 that we now have high availability on the resource manager um, and on a per application basis. So that if, if uh, the resource manager does go down, um, you don't have to restart your, all of your jobs as you did before with MR1. Utilization. MR1 had fixed slots, so if you had, you had to earmark a certain number of map tasks, a certain number of reduced tasks, if you ended up needing more reduced tasks and you had excess map tasks, you could not port over those map tasks to become reduced tasks. That's no longer an issue with MR2. We have, um, we just have generic uh, slots which can be allocated as needed. And because of this, the cluster can be more fully utilized than it ever could be under MR1. A best practice under MR1 was to actually purposely underutilize your cluster by 70%. And the thinking behind that was you wanted to make sure you had enough slots for your largest job. And so a lot of time that meant your cluster sat unutilized just in case you needed to fulfill the needs of a large job. With MR2, you no longer need to provision for your lar largest job. It's, it's a much more dynamic basis where you have dynamic allocation. Um, and finally, multi-tenancy was not possible with MR1. As I mentioned earlier, we wanted customers to run HBase on a separate cluster as MR1 to make sure that the batch processing of MapReduce didn't under interfere with the low latency requirements of HBase. But with, with MR2, that's it's no longer a concern, and, and we're able to, to do resource management adequately so that you can run a multi-tenant cluster and then save on, on both the, the lowered operational costs from sharing resources as well as on data locality. Upgrading from MR1 to MR2. Given that it's a completely revamped architecture from MR1 to MR2, some of the configurations don't exactly translate over. The main thing to keep in mind is, is that with MR2 on Yarn, it's not just um, do you have enough memory. You also need to take a look at your CPU utilization as well. With MR1, as long as you had enough memory, um, your, your heap sizes were properly allocated, you were good to go. With MR2, um, sometimes a job will not run if it reaches not just the memory threshold, but the CPU threshold as well. So here are a few um, configs to keep in mind when you're allocating your jobs on MR2. And these slides will be made available as well. If they aren't available already, they will be shortly. Your compatibility um, is, is pretty good from MR1 to MR2. There is pretty much uh, binary and source compat compatibility for almost all programs. But of course, even though virtually every job compiled against MR1, um, without 
modification on an MR2 cluster, there are still definitely um, a few gotchas, um, which are outlined in the, the blog post um, in the, the column on the right. Yarn upgrade pitfalls. With MR2, we split up um, where we stored a job. So the job tracker was no longer storing the jobs. It was instead on the job history server. Um, and as a result, um, it's, it's important to, to realize that the log, where the logs are, the logs are in a different place in MR1 than they are in MR2, um, which, is, which is good to keep in mind as you're troubleshooting your, your yarn jobs. Um, so these are a few log parameters. There are some more too, but these are the basic ones to keep in mind um, as, as you're, you're upgrading to MR2. Yarn applications, Llama, Slider, and Spark. Llama stands for a low latency application master, and it's, it's specifically for short-lived processes. One example is Impala, which is um, a, a, um, a SQL engine. Uh, with Llama, you're able to register one long-lived application master per yarn pool. Um, that way, it caches resources so that um, you can quickly reallocate them to in, in Impala queries and reduce some of that, that startup cost. Um, we currently recommend setting up a mission control, actually, uh, because even though the long-term solution is to run Impala on Yarn, there are still a few things to work out. Similarly with Apache Slider, which used to be known as Hoya, Slider, unlike um, Llama, Llama runs short-lived applications. Slider is meant to run long-lived persistent services on Yarn, such as HBase. Uh, we also currently don't recommend this as it doesn't provide IO isolation. On to Spark I, on Yarn, which I'll turn over to Miklash. So the next part of this talk will focus on running Spark on Yarn, which is currently our recommended deployment model for running Spark in your cluster. And I'll go over the details of why we do recommend that. So just an overview of what Spark is today. Um, you know, it's the, the next MapReduce, essentially. You know, an overview is to your right. Um, here is an example of what a job would look like. You have the Spark driver, which could have actually multiple jobs within this one jar that you're shipping to your cluster. And each one has its own set of tasks that are deployed to your executors that are also run on top of your cluster. And we'll go into how this ties into Yarn in the next slide, but this is just for an overview. The application corresponds to an instance of the Spark context class, which is the brains of your, your job. This is where you're going to write your logic, and this is where the logic will be passed down to your executors, which you can think about are your map and reduce tasks. Executors are long-lived processes, which is different in when you're thinking about how MapReduce used to work. You would spin up one JVM, run a task, and then tear it down and spin up your next one. Here, the tasks are assigned. Multiple tasks can be assigned to a single JVM, which is what the executor is. Applications will take up resources until the app completes. That was the initial, uh, that was the initial uh, deployment model for running Spark on Yarn. But as we see later, there has been an, a few improvements to the project where you can scale down the resources if your Spark application isn't leveraging them at the time. So why run Spark on Yarn? So today, Spark can run on a few different frameworks. Mesos is one of them. You could run a Spark standalone, which is another way to run it, where you have a Spark master and Spark worker daemons running on your cluster. But why we suggest Spark on Yarn is for the following reasons. It has a, a better scheduler for resource management. So it ties into the, the fair scheduler or FIFO scheduler, whatever you're using within Yarn. Uh, to deploy your jobs to the cluster. Sharing resources within the cluster as well. So with Fair Scheduler, you could turn on preemption to make sure that no job is uh, starving the cluster of resources. You can share those resources fairly between different types of workloads. Those could be MapReduce and those could be Spark. Uh, you can also have scalding jobs, whatever framework you want to run on top of Yarn, they can play nicely together. Also, if you have security as a key requirement in your cluster, 
Yarn is the only cluster manager for Spark that supports security, aka a Kerberized cluster. So if that is a requirement today, that, you know, that's where it stands today. So configuring Yarn for Spark. So it's the, the reason people are using Spark is it's defined for interactive queries or iterative algorithms. Um, it leverages a, key feature, a few key features such as in-memory caching. Um, it builds a DAG engine, which is a directed acyclical graph of, of tasks to run within your job. And it has a much richer set of APIs compared to MapReduce. There, there are commonalities between the two APIs, but to really dig into those, that can go into a different talk. We have a few blog posts on our own internal website that kind of go over how you can convert MapReduce jobs to Spark jobs. Um, here we talk about one of the properties within Yarn that you would need to set uh, on, on your cluster depending on how much RAM you have in your cluster. So in this example here, we have 192 gigs of memory on a host. And you want to set the maximum allocation per megabyte as high as 64 gigs on the machine. Depending on your application, Spark's executors require a good amount of memory. So this, this configuration parameter will say you have up to 64 gigs of memory per executor on your cluster. Uh, the, one of the, the problems that some people have run into are you cannot run Spark jobs with small containers because there's some amount of overhead when you're trying to spin up the jobs. So don't be surprised if you're using a lot of resources to run your jobs today. And here, the last link is a link to resource management and the Yarn, Yarn application models uh, that kind of goes into a deep dive of how you deploy Spark on Yarn. So here we'll go into deploying Spark on Yarn in multiple uh, fashions. I'll, in the next few slides, I'll go into detail on the difference between the Yarn cluster and Yarn client mode and why that should matter to, to anyone. Spark standalone is just for comparison. That's when you're running uh, Spark using the standalone model where you have a Spark master and Spark worker deployed on your cluster. So the, the difference is the driver, where the driver runs, where the application's logic is running compared it to all three modes of uh, deployment. Cl Yarn cluster, your application master is actually going to be run on the cluster. So uh, the, the logic is spun up on some random node in your cluster, and that will deploy the additional logic to your executors. In Yarn client mode, wherever you're submitting the task, that's where the driver is going to run. So if you're doing a Spark submit to submit the job to the cluster, the logic is going to be run locally on that node. And that's the same thing for st Spark standalone. So who requests the resources is the next section. Application master for Yarn cluster and Yarn client are both going to re request the resources for the executors. Uh, who starts the executor processes? The Yarn node managers for both of the first deployment models. And persistent storage uh, services are the resource manager and node managers uh, are the long-running daemons that are leveraged to spin up the, the processes mentioned above. And support Spark Shell. For the Yarn cluster mode, it doesn't support the Spark Shell today because your driver is running somewhere on the cluster. So you do not have a, an active connection to that node because that driver could be spun up on any of the nodes in your cluster, and you don't know which one. Um, Yarn decides that in its own manner, so you, there's no predetermined logic for that. For Yarn client mode, or for Yarn client mode, the driver is local, so you can, you can have an interactive REPL to interact with the executors that are spun up on the cluster. So typically, if you have a job that's fully complete, you're going to use Yarn cluster mode. You can schedule that with Uzi and run it on the cluster, and then look at the results later. For Yarn client is typically if you want to test out some APIs or functionality, read some data, and you want to do that interactively, right? It doesn't take too long with having uh, with using Spark today, so you can test out some of your APIs and your logic and see the results uh, on your terminal. So here we have a diagram of the Yarn client mode deployment model. 
you see that the client application is just a, a node where a user logs in, and they might say Spark shell or Spark submit in some Py job. The Spark, and then to, to specify the yarn client mode, there's an option called dash dash master, and you would say yarn dash client. And that will, know, that will notify the Spark submit command to know that the driver should be run local, and the application master, which requests the resources from Yarn, is going to be spun up on the cluster. Now, the rest of the resources for the executors are spun up on, on node managers in containers, Yarn containers that you specify. And the executor requires some memory parameters, like how much RAM you want to give to the Spark executors and the number of cores that you want for the CPU per executor. And that's what the Spark application master is requesting from the resource manager. And the Spark executor will run uh, a, a task within its JVM. So the next slide is going to compare Yarn cluster mode, where the driver is living with the Spark application master. So the difference here is that it's not on the host machine where you try to run the Spark shell or run Spark submit, but it's actually co-located with the application master. The rest of the process is very similar. You ask for resources from the resource manager, you spin up executors on the cluster, and then you assign tasks to those, res uh, to those executors. One of the new features that have been added to to Spark uh, is dynamic resource allocation, which means when you're not using the, exec the executor resources that you see here, we, we can spin down these, the resources that are currently being held by Yarn and then spin and bump again if you, when you need to use them. So if you have a Spark streaming job and you don't need all the executors, you can set uh, an idle timeout and uh, the min and max number of executors to kind of scale up and scale down your application. And so there's a few knobs here that I've documented on what those properties, what properties would need to be set to, to allow this to happen on your cluster. Today, in previous releases, once you started the Spark application, we would consume all those resources. Even if it were doing a sleep, those executors would hold on to those resources and nothing in your cluster would be able to leverage them. But with this feature, you can spin down those executors, use the additional resources that are available to run your normal jobs. Uh, another reason is that I mentioned earlier is using the fair scheduler for resource sharing. The bottom is just a UI that we have in one of our tools for defining the, the resource management options and configurations. But you, you can set different pool weights and properties to allow different types of jobs to have more or less resources depending on the priority of the job. So you can grant your users who have high SLA jobs access to the Spark production pool, which you can see here has a higher weight than the Spark test pool. And your users which submit jobs here request uh, resources and run their jobs. And if the Spark prod pool doesn't have enough resources, you can configure fair scheduler preemption to kill jobs in, kill tasks of jobs in the Spark test pool to gather those resources until they meet their fair share requirements here. So I'm gonna go into a few issues that customers have run into um, since the, the beginning of running Spark on Yarn. Here, one of the symptoms is when they use Spark submit to run a Python job, they don't see any resources being used on the cluster when you look at the Yarn web UI, which is at the bottom. The reason is there was a, a bug in the Spark submit command. And if, if you noticed, the reason that the job was instead run locally and not on the cluster was the order of the arguments. So if you see the two syntaxes for the Spark job submission, the cause was the first one where the Python script was actually given as the first argument to the Spark submit command versus the, the second command, the Python script was the last argument and then the 1000 is the argument to that Python script. And if you look at the usage text, that's also how it specifies it. 
the options is actually the master option needs to go first and then your Python or JAR file and the Python and JAR files options last. And so there's a JIRA to improve this um, in Spark 1.2, 1.3 that are, that are out now and the Spark JIRA is right there. Another one is PySpark on Yarn limitation. So a lot of people use PySpark because it's, if you're not using PySpark and writing Python code, you can write it in Scala or Java. Scala is a little easier, Python is even easier, and most people like to use Python because it's just an easier you know, language to work with. Previously, there, there was no method to deploy uh, Python jobs with Yarn cluster mode, meaning the driver couldn't run on, on a node in the cluster, and it had to run local to where you were doing the submission. Here, cluster deploy mode is not applicable, is the error warning you would see when you try to do this. There is an enhancement Jira to get this fixed. Uh, it's fixed in Spark 1.3, and there might be additional improvements there. But now they've added that functionality. So understanding the limitations of what, where the, the, the product is today is, is also interesting um, for your end users and operators as well. Lost Spark executors. Another common symptom is in the driver or in your, your executor logs, you're gonna see this strange error about your current usage uh, of your physical memory and virtual memory used is greater than your, your yarn configurations and it's gonna kill the container. And the reason why most people run into this is the defaults are not very great. Uh, lost Spark executors, the workaround would be to increase the Spark Yarn executor or driver memory overhead. And what is the memory overhead? It's the additional amount of memory for your Spark executor uh, to specify the container size. So if you have a Spark executor that is allowed two gigs of, of RAM, you should specify the memory overhead, say one gig, and if you add those two together, that's gonna be your container size that, Yarn, that Spark will request from Yarn. So that container size that you see will be three gigs. Spark Executor will have two gigs of memory to work with. And the default today is three, 384 megabytes. And typically the best practice for these properties are, I believe it was 10 to 15% of the, the memory of your executor or driver. So you would have to set this per job today. It's not something that we automatically calculate for you because your usage can vary depending on your workload. And why do you have an overhead? It's used for data, uh, object serialization, also your JVM overhead, um, because if you go out of bounds of your container, where Yarn as a framework will kill you. This is something that's very different than how MapReduce used to work. Um, Spark is a pretty, fast changing project. There's a lot of improvements. Um, the shuffle logic is something that's very important to understand on how to profile your Spark jobs. Here are a few JIRAs that show that there are a lot of enhancements that are going on within the project today, but there's also still a fair amount of bugs that you know we are working with the community on solving. And one of the, the most uh, interesting ones are Spark 7308 that's being, it's open today and it's uh, a pretty important bug that needs to be fixed across all releases in Spark. And here are a few other improvements that have happened within the, the release recently. PySpark and Yarn Cluster Mode, which I've referenced earlier. The Spark Action Executor. Spark Streaming Wall on HDFS to prevent data loss on driver failure and the wall refers to the write ahead log. So you wanna commit events from the Spark streaming job to HDFS so that if you were to fail, you can recover uh, from those events. Uh, a Spark external shuffle service, this ties into the previous slide about the shuffle improvements within Spark. And improvements in the collection of task metrics. The, the last one is a Kafka connector for Spark streaming to avoid the need for the HDFS Right ahead log. So in conclusion, Spark is pretty complex today. Uh, 
it helps improve cluster utilization, can run more jobs in a smaller cluster, uh, dynamic resources sharing between frameworks. And for more details about Yarn and the, its implementation and performance, the new definitive guide is out by Tom White. Any questions? So the question is, if you had to create multiple Spark contexts for, to support impersonation, can they run in the same JVM? Um, well, I guess my question to you is, why do you need to run a separate Spark context versus if the user is submitting the Spark job to the cluster or creating the Spark context themselves, it's going to spin up as that user, right? Or, or is your question, you want to impersonate another user? That's a good question. I, I'll have, I don't know the answer to that. Because I, I think if you were to, sp I would have to look at how the executor processes are spun up and what system user those are today. Uh, that's a good question. I would, I'd have to look into the code and figure out how, how to do that and if it's possible. I don't know if there's like a do as functionality. In MapReduce, there was something that users could do to set the user, um, but that's a good question. Okay, yeah, okay. Question? So I would say the, the let's go back to, yeah. So the, the question was, if, if I were, if you, you want to migrate your existing MapReduce workloads to Spark, and you're deciding between the Yarn cluster or Yarn client mode for the deployment of those jobs, and what are the performance impacts between the two? So today, Yarn client is more used for interactive workloads, where you have a shell open that you want to get real-time results. If you're migrating batch ETL workflows, you're going to use the Yarn cluster. In terms of performance, your executors, they're going to be running the same logic, and there's no performance impact between the two. The, the usage between the two is, is different. For you, if you're, if you're submitting the jobs, in Ma old MapReduce, I, don't, I can't think of if there was a way to have an interactive REPL to run MapReduce jobs. So it, for you, it would be Yarn cluster mode. You would write your jobs and then submit them, create a jar, and then submit them to your cluster. Either you can use Uzi or you can have a deployment model you have today. No, there shouldn't be, but the main difference is the Yarn client mode is if you're, you're prototyping, essentially, right? Yeah. Yeah. So with, with the, I think there's another point you're trying to make is, um, so you, you have a lot of Python jobs, a lot of uh, MapReduce streaming jobs that use Python today, and you still want to leverage Python as your, your language of choice. Now, 
Python and Scala, they're the two languages that you can use to write Spark jobs today, and they're, they're feature parity, meaning you have all the APIs in, in Scala as you do in Python, so that's not a problem. Uh, submitting them, again, not a problem as well. You would just use this mode of deployment, so Spark submit master its yarn uh, dash cluster, I think there's a typo here. And then, uh, then you would say the Python script that you would want to run, and then whatever arguments you have. And that shouldn't be a problem. I would say the, the biggest challenge there is migrating the APIs and how the, the, the logic within your MapReduce 1 uh, jobs and converting them to the APIs of, of Spark. Like, reduce is not going to give you the exact uh, reduce that you imagine in MapReduce. You might be, it's, it might be reduced by key, so you need to look at the implementation of, and the APIs that you need to call. Mm -hmm. um, when you said small containers are a problem, can you be a little more precise in terms of how small? If, if typically, there, we have customers who, say, had one or two gigs for the max container size, and the overhead already is, what, 300, 400 megabytes? So by default, if you're trying to specify larger executors, the job will fail. That's just the, the main point of it. Uh, figuring out how much uh, memory your executors need today is, is kind of like a test and, and check. Um, today, if it passes or not. The, we're still trying to expose metrics to gain deeper insight on how much memory do you need per 100 megabyte compressed three-time compression of a Parquet file. That's, for example, uh, you know, how would you map those two together? Today, it's, it's a little more difficult to do. So the question is, uh, for Java, does it have to be an Uber jar, or can you specify the class path? I, uh, I believe it does not need to be an Uber jar. You don't need to include all the Spark dependencies, because those can be already on the cluster today. So it can just be your job. Oh, if your jar requires other libraries. I believe the Spark submit should have a, a lib jars or, or some functionality to say these are my dependency jars and ship them to the cluster as well, just like MapReduce. Any other questions? So the, yeah. so, the, so the question is, if you're migrating from pre-yarn to post-yarn, how do you dedicate, would, you, would it require you to dedicate a machine for the log service? Uh, no, you, you would not. So the, what happens today is you, you, the log service uh, would gather all the task logs that are written locally on the node managers. and. Uh, and then aggregate them and put them into HDFS. So let's see. But you could run the resource manager and the job history server, which is the log server, on the same nodes. They would just have, uh, they would just be in different JVMs, and they would have their own either four, eight gigs, or 16 gigs um, of, of, of heap space for them. Great, thanks everyone.